What do you do? What do I do? That doesn't really benefit me at all, but someday will be a blessing to my children, grandchildren, or the next generation. There's an intriguing story in the book of Genesis that is classic Eastern storytelling. It gives some details without explaining why those particular details are meaningful. It's called the tamarisk tree story. I like to think of it as the tamarisk tree principle. Abraham has been promised the promised land, the land of Israel. He hasn't received it yet. In fact, in this moment of the text, he doesn't even have a place to be buried should he pass away or for his wife to be buried. He has nothing of what God has promised. But God comes to him again and renews his promise that Abraham, I promise you and I promise your descendants this land. Now, from a Western point of view, you next expect Abram to respond, maybe with a question like, well, when will this happen? Or maybe simply an awareness of appreciation. Thank you so much. I trust you. I appreciate it. But Abram is Eastern. He's Jewish, the father of the Hebrews. So he does an action which is intended to communicate what he's thinking. Abraham then goes on a journey from where he is near Hebron to a town called Beersheba, about a day's journey, maybe a day and a half. And it says he planted a tamarisk tree and called on the name of the Lord. That's the end of the story and immediately picks up with a totally different story. So it doesn't explain why he did that or why he chose tamarisk tree and not some other olive tree or pomegranate tree or, or palm tree. Why a tamarisk? I think the answer is in the cultural understanding of what he did. Abraham is in the desert. Beersheba is in the desert. Shade is at a premium. There isn't much shade, and it is a desert where it can be really, really hot. There are trees that will grow there, but they need to be tended. They're called tamarisk trees. So often, a Bedouin family, a nomadic desert family, will plant a tamarisk tree. They'll either have to water it with water skins on the back of a donkey or a camel, or sometimes they direct water that comes down from the mountains some distance away. That's less common, but that happens too, because without that careful watering, the tamarisk tree is not going to survive. Now, that tamarisk tree has no fruit that can be used. It's such a slow-growing tree, it's never going to produce lumber or timber to use in building everything, anything. It's simply a tree that provides shade for that family. So the idea is you plant a tamarisk tree, you put hours and hours and hours into tending it, and slowly but surely it provides this precious commodity of shade when the desert heat is intense. It's such a slow growing tree that you will never enjoy it yourself, no matter how old you live, at least not in terms of life expectancy in our world. So Abraham is planting a tree he's not going to get shade from. He's planting a tree knowing that that will be for his children or more likely his grandchildren. So the tamarisk principle, that's my term, is to do something that isn't going to benefit me or you, but to do something that God will use to benefit the next generation or even a generation or two later. So what Abraham did was to say, God, I trust you so much I believe you're going to give me this land that I'm going to plant a tree that my grandchildren will sit under to enjoy the shade. It's this incredible act of faith, but it's an also an action of doing something that will pay benefits long after I've finished this life. So the legacy principle is what do you do? What do I do? That doesn't really benefit me at all, but someday will be a blessing to my children, grandchildren, or the next generation. That's the, the tamarisk principle or the legacy principle. So my prayer has been in my life that what I do today isn't purely for me. It may be a blessing when I do it, but isn't done for my benefit, but it's done in a way so that as it's anointed by God, it may take a lot of work like a tamarisk tree. It brings benefits to future generations well long after I'm gone. Now, I think that can be applied to many areas of life. I think fundamentally, the legacy I want to leave is that not only did I teach 
the Word of God faithfully as He entrusted it to me, as He taught me through others, but that I lived it. So people will say, it's not only what RVL said, it's who RVL was. I think that's the biggest legacy that I can leave behind, is that people see that my life was an example of what the scriptures called us to be, or where it wasn't, I repented and moved in the direction of obedience so that I become a picture of what that looks like in practice. I think that's the legacy I would pray my students remember. So as you think about it, and you think about the tamarisk trees in your life, it could be an actual physical thing. You could build a Bible institute or contribute to a ministry that doesn't benefit you, but may pay off in future generations to others. But I think it's everything in life that becomes tamarisk. I think the same thing is true in marriage. It's such a radical thing in the culture we live in to be married and to stay married for your life to the same person. But to be married and to have a godly marriage becomes a tamarisk tree because it says to my world, this is what I think godly marriage looks like. Not what I told you we do or who we are, but how I live in my marriage. So I think tamarisk can be applied to any and all situations by living out, putting God on display by the way I live out my faith.